you, Diana, and thank you all for uh, joining us. And uh, so happy and privileged to uh, speak to you and address this really important and relevant uh, topic of uh, Christian Zionism as uh, an imperial uh, theology. Uh, a talk that is, as I said, is uh, extremely important and relevant. Uh, the impact and influence of Christian Zionism have been manifested, uh, especially in the last uh, four years uh, uh, during the uh, Trump presidency. And uh, just it was evident to everyone how influential they are. What I'm going to do in uh, next in today's presentation uh, is try to look deeper into the DNA of Christian Zionism uh, and look at Christian Zionism not simply as a theological belief, this is what the Bible says, but more than that, into, as I said, the DNA, the, uh, uh, you know, its uh, 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 relationship to uh, uh, the whole matrix of empire and control uh, and power, and even the relationship between East uh, and, uh, and West. So I'm going to share some uh, slides with you as well. Uh, and I'll be more than happy to share the presentation uh, later with, uh, uh, with the team. One second. Yep. So uh, as I said, the title of my presentation is Christian Zionism as Imperial Theology, and it's based on uh, two chapters of my recent book, The Other Side uh, of, uh, of the Wall. Uh, and obviously, uh, I will be speaking as a Palestinian. I will be speaking from my own uh, experience and uh, locale uh, as occupied, uh, as displaced, uh, as you know, part of the Palestinian people, which uh, in the state of Israel are treated like second class citizens, especially under the nation state law. So it's my uh, uh, perspective comes from uh, my position uh, as uh, a Palestinian. Uh, and as such, I say, I speak from hurt and pain and from the other side of the wall. And as you will see in my presentation, uh, the wall to me refers to more than just the physical, the ugly physical concrete wall in Bethlehem but it's more a narrative of separation, a mentality or a worldview of, uh, of separation and displacement that has long existed uh, in, the why, in the mind and ethos of Western uh, Christendom. Uh, and to understand the impact of Christian Zionism, let's just go back to what happened in 1948, what, what the world celebrated as the miracle of the establishment of the state of Israel, uh, we looked at as the Nakba. The Nakba is an Arabic word for catastrophe. Just think of uh, the Nakba in small numbers in terms of the number of villages that were completely destroyed. Uh, uh, the uh, number of uh, refugees, uh, 800,000. We lost more than 78% of our historical land in addition to the thousands who were killed and please understand that the Nakba never stopped. The Nakba continues uh, today. Uh, I live in Bethlehem where if you look at this map and the complication of this map, you will realize, see the wall in red, how it cuts deep into the West Bank. It's separating Palestinian community from another Palestinian community and basically creating a reality of gated communities, gated Palestinian communities where we live in these uh, uh, communities in Bethlehem, in the big cities in Hebron, in Nablus, in Ramallah, but Israel controls everything around us and continues the expansion of settlements. So uh, uh, where I come from in, in Bethlehem, we are still living under an Israeli occupation. Yes, we have a Palestinian authority and a Palestinian government, but the uh, Israeli occupation defines our uh, reality, a reality of uh, inequality that is manifested in so many ways. Uh, in the distribution of water, uh, in the laws of uh, immigration, uh, who can uh, live and, you know, where uh, some of our church members uh, are not able to unite with their spouses, uh, whereas any Jew can immigrate to our land and they will have more right 
than we do as Palestinians. The daily humiliations on checkpoint, uh, the economical disparities, and more recently, uh, the COVID reality where, you know, one people in the same land are vaccinated and the other are still waiting. Uh, all of this defines our reality today. Yet, despite all of that, and this, you know, we can have different political interpretation, of course, to everything, but despite all of that, uh, this all was and continues to be celebrated as a miracle, as a divine act. Uh, Israel, the creation of Israel as a state, continues to be celebrated by Christians today uh, as a sign of divine intervention, as a miracle from God, or as a fulfillment of prophecy. When it comes to the church in general uh, and uh, Israel, how uh, uh, the Christians around the world look at the state of Israel today, these four principles more or less summarize how many Christians, if not most Christians, understand the Bible in relation to the situation today. These are what I call uh, the, the main assumptions of Christian Zionism, but please note that these assumptions are sometimes shared by many, uh, just, you know, your day-to-day uh, uh, -day Christians in the pews who might not even realize that this is called or this is part of the uh, Christian Zionism agenda. Uh, basically that the Abrahamic covenant continues with the Jewish people today uh, and by association with the state of Israel. Uh, as I said, this is a common assumption among many Christians. Uh, and I want you to pause for a moment and think of the implication of such an assertion on Palestinians, how this is perceived by us as Palestinians. The idea that those we are in conflict with or even those who are occupying us, oppressing us, are in relationship with God. Just think of, we, we immediately ask, where do we fit in this? And note that in this assumption, there is another assumption that maybe I didn't write and I should have, that the Israel of today is a direct continuation of the Israel of the Bible. Uh, similarly, many see the creation of Israel in 1948, as I said, either as a fulfillment of prophecy, especially among evangelicals, whereas others see it uh, equally as a sign to God's faithfulness to the Jewish people. By the way, all of these are either direct quotes or taken from uh, uh, official church statements or uh, church leaders. The idea that the creation of Israel is, is a sign to God's faithfulness is very common in Protestant churches, not, not necessarily evangelical churches. Uh, and again, I must ask, what is this telling me as a Palestinian? Because if uh, the creation of Israel is a sign of God's faithfulness to the Jewish people, it is a sign of God's what exactly to the Palestinians? Does that mean that God is against us? Is God judging us? Uh, that begs the question that many Palestinians ask, where is the gospel, the good news of Christianity to the Palestinians if what happened to us in 1948 is simply a divine act? Uh, another assumption is uh, the, the uh, um, you know, I'm sure you've heard it and it's very common. It is not just very common, for example, in North America, but I've seen that it's common and I travel to speak on this topic and always met people who believe this in whether in uh, East Asia or in Africa or uh, Latin America, the idea that if you bless Israel, God will bless you. But if you stand against Israel, God will curse you. Now this is based or they based this on Genesis 12, uh, one to three, where actually the, uh, the address is actually about Abraham. It doesn't mention his descendants or, uh, and the Bible reads this as a sign of God's blessings to the people through Christ. Yet somehow that statement from God to Abraham uh, became the way in which many Christians today relate to a secular state. And to me, that's incomprehensible. But that led many people to uh, support Israel simply because they want what's best for them, not, not necessarily for Israel. I look at this principle and I always say, this is 101 religious manipulation for a political purpose. You're manipulating people using a religious text to support a political position. You have to support Israel or what? 
or else you will be under God's wrath. However, if you give money to Israel or if you do political action on behalf of Israel, God will bless your life and your ministry. And finally, the assumption that the land that we call today Palestine and Israel uh, belongs to the Jewish people as an eternal possession because God gave it to them. And as such, Jews have a divine right to the, uh, to the land. Uh, this led, by the way, many Palestinians to write a lot on the theology of the promised land. I wrote my PhD about this topic, but I don't want to go into the biblical text and, and analyze this assumption, but to simply ask as a Palestinian again, and I continue to bring it back to the question of how does this come across to us as Palestinians? Because now you're telling me that the land of my ancestors, where I've been born and my ancestors have been born, and we've been here for hundreds, if not thousands of years, somehow is not ours. And so we are taking someone else's land and even worse, we're standing against God. The idea of a divine right puts me in an opposition uh, to God. And you see, so these assumptions, if you ask many Christians around the world, do you believe God gave the land to the Jews? They say, yeah, definitely. And again, I ask, so what about us Palestinians? But you see what's missing in all of this narrative is precisely the Palestinian element we don't exist. And please keep this in mind because this will be a common thread in my presentation. So Christian Zionism defined, if you wish uh, to get a straightforward definition, I, I like Robert Smith's definition in his book, More Desire Than Our Own Salvation. It is political action informed by specifically Christian commitments to promote or preserve Jewish control over the geographic area now comprising Israel and Palestine. I, I like this definition because it reminds us that we're talking not simply about a theological belief or a theological school, but about a political movement, a political action. Uh, and when it comes to how this political movement functions, Stephen Sizer in one of his books uh, identifies at least these six ways in which Christian Zionists uh, act on behalf on Israel or support uh, Israel by political lobbying on behalf of Israel. And as I said, this has been very much manifested during the Trump presidency, which was fueled by the support of evangelicals. And one of their tenants was the support for Israel. And this was translated to political decisions like the movement of the embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, and one of Trump's famous quotes about this when he said, I did it for the evangelicals. I didn't do it for Israel. Just think of that. Um, they support and finance Jewish immigration to the land, which when you pause a little bit again to think of it from a Palestinian perspective, these are my sisters and brothers donating money for people to come from outside of my land, take my land and have more rights than the rights I have in my land. So to us Palestinians, this is just mind boggling. Uh, support the settlements politically and financially. Uh, this is well documented. And one of the shocking figures is how much money goes from churches to settlement projects. Uh, and we're not talking about thousands of dollars or millions of dollars. Uh, we're talking about hundreds of millions and in some cases, but you know, lots of money is going to Israeli settlements. Settlements that most uh, diplomats recognize as the main obstacle to peace and to the two-state uh, solution. Obviously, they oppose the division of Jerusalem and uh, again, the movement of the embassy. Some radicals support the rebuilding of the temple and this will have catastrophic results. And most oppose any peace process and any giving of the land to the Palestinians, which they see as a compromise. Of course, they're sitting at the comfort of their offices and you know, defining reality uh, for us. What's common again in the DNA of Christian Zionism is that we are missing as Palestinians. We are ignored at best and dehumanized at worst. Uh, this is the kind of, uh, one of the most common things I see among Christian Zionists. They uh, act as if the land is empty, as if Israel was created on an empty land. Uh, this is seen in the infamous uh, uh, slogan that the Zionists promoted, which 
uh, many Christian leaders in Britain in particular promoted before Zionism was birthed. The idea of a land without people for a people without a land, which before that was uh, a, a country without a nation for a nation without a country. Uh, and th th the main premise here is that the land was empty, but you know too well the land was not empty. Actually, they knew too well the land was not empty. And in the case of the British mandate, uh, it's not just the Belfort Declaration, everything related to it, they knew too well that the land was not empty because they occupied us. Yet still our land was described as a land without people because as uh, Ben White put it in his book, uh, uh, yes, they knew that the land has people, but for them, we, the Palestinians, were a complete irrelevance. For the Zionist Palestine was empty, not literally, but in terms of people of equal worth to the incoming settlers. This is a typical colonial mentality, and dare I say a typical colonial Christian mentality. Yes, the land has people, but they can be shifted. Uh, we can control their fate. Uh, and today we still hear the idea, why don't you go to Jordan? Today we still hear debates like this. Do Jews have a divine right to Israel's land? Uh, uh, where a discussion is, is made about our land, they call it Israel's land, but uh, we are continually ignored in such discussions. This is an example of a discussion in Christianity today. The two authors are an American leader and a Messianic Jewish American leader sitting at the comfort of their offices discussing our land as if it's empty. And you know, what about our perspective? But you say our perspective does not matter. That's the issue. And by the way, in this case, I actually emailed Christianity today saying, can I respond? At the time I was still writing my PhD on the topic and I lived in this land, but that didn't give me the merit in their eyes to actually be part of the conversation. Why? Because we don't matter. Yes, the land has people, they knew that but it doesn't matter because true understanding of the Bible and uh, uh, righteous acts come from us. That's the whole uh, uh, nation. Uh, to me, this is the original war uh, in that we are invisible uh, in theology books. We don't exist. We are invisible in the language of the church. Uh, I call this the myth of returning to an empty land. That's the myth that many, many, if not most Christians simply assume. If you ask them about Palestinians, they probably don't know, not only that, you know, much about us, but they, they're shocked to know Palestinian Christians exist. And at best they, they describe the idea of Israel creating a garden of Eden in the middle of the desert. It was an empty land. The idea of returning, you know, again, puts me as a Palestinian in the wrong place. It's as if, I have occupied someone else's land, even though this is the land of our ancestors. The same applies, by the way, to how most pilgrims today, when they come to the Holy Land, spend at best two hours in Bethlehem. Why? Because, you know, again, we don't exist. And if we exist in their mind, we are the dangerous, backward people on the other side of the world people to be feared, people to be dehumanized. Uh, and, and in the mentality of the wall, those we isolate or separate to the other side of the wall, because they, in their understanding, brought it to themselves, they're terrorists, they're uh, radical Islam and so on. You can stereotype who, whatever way you want. And actually you can then justify all acts of violence against them. That is the mentality. That's, that's what I mean by a colonial uh, DNA or a colonial uh, theology, when you look at Palestinians as less humans. I'm going to unpack this more now as I looked at certain elements in the theology of Christian Zionism and try to illustrate it by certain uh, example. Uh, and so let's look at now what I mean precisely by that idea of uh, imperial theology. First of all, we have the, the whole employment of God. It's not simply that we're talking about a chosen people, a theological principle, but now it's, it's even a chosen state. Uh, uh, God is on Israel's side. And as such, we must be on the right side and stand with Israel because we want to stand with God. 
This is how one Christian Zionist leaders and one of the most influential in the 80s put it. To stand against Israel is to stand against God. It's, it's plain simple. We believe that history and scripture prove that God deals with nations in relation to how they deal with, uh, with Israel. You see how God here is brought to a struggle. And it's shocking to me how when the same Western Christendom criticizes uh, uh, or challenges, uh, calls out Islam for making a conflict religious and using religion in politics, they're perfectly fine applying the same principles on Israel, making the uh, conflict a religious conflict. This is when the conflict was made uh, uh, religious. And so anything we do is opposing God. As I said in this, article that I mentioned, do Jews have a divine right? Because what if the answer to such a question is, yes, Jews have a divine right to the land? Where does that leave me as a Palestinian? Can I object? You see, if I object that statement, I would be standing against God. And that's the whole essence of Christian uh, Zionism. In that mentality, the world is divided into us versus them. And them, is the uh, Arab Muslims in this case, are to be feared. Uh, instilling fear is one of the most powerful uh, tools of Christian Zionism. Uh, they, you know, uh, they always, for example, exaggerate the threat of the Arab countries. They always use, for example, there are 250 million Arabs just waiting to uh, destroy Israel. And of course that myth was uh, uh, put aside at least for a moment with the so-called peace deals between Israel and the uh, Arab states. Iran becomes then the, the, the enemy and even many Christian Zionist leaders called for nuking Iran just or bombing Iran uh, because of that, because they characterize the other as to be feared. Uh, and that's a, uh, all of this comes from a position of privilege where uh, you know we we act as if we're superior to others uh, i call this you know assuming that there are us and them where the judeo christian tradition uh, uh, is superior to everything else especially in this case uh, to islam uh, and, and that's really uh, the essence of that term how at least it is used by many the whole idea of the judeo christian tradition as we are superior to others. Uh, I use some quotes to highlight this. This was back in 2016. Uh, evangelical leaders were, you know, meeting with Trump before the elections to show support. And uh, they prayed for him. And one of them uh, said these words, only two nations have been in relationship with God in history. Israel and the United States of America. See how, you know, it's more about, we are the only two nations in a relationship with God. But to me, nothing uh, uh, describes or illustrates this mentality of superiority and we're better than everyone else and division, the mentality of the wall, more than this quote by Mike Pence, uh, previous American vice president, uh, a, an evangelical himself, uh, who spoke in front of the Israeli Knesset or parliament um, uh, when it, during a visit. And he said those words. Uh, and I want you to pay attention to how Palestinians are described in these words. He said, we stand with Israel because your cause is our cause. Your values are our values and your fight is our fight. We stand with Israel because we believe in right over wrong, in good over evil, and in liberty over tyranny. It, it, it might look like a simple statement or a quote, but in reality, what Mike Pence is saying, you know, notice who are the Palestinians in this quote? We are the wrong, the evil, and the tyrant. And the Israelis are those who are right, who are good, and who believe in liberty. Uh, the irony in all of this is that the only thing we're asking as Palestinians is our own liberty. Yet asking it makes us the tyrant. Uh, just, just think of that. But look how the world is divided into us versus them. 
And if we're dealing with a people who are wrong, who are evil, who are tyrant, then you can basically do anything because you are better. Uh, th that's what I mean by the DNA of, of Christian uh, Zionism. Now, one might be wondering, maybe, maybe Mike Pence was referring to radical Islam here or so on, but our experience has shown that all of this is even applied to us as Palestinian Christians, simply because we challenge uh, the Christian Zionist narrative and the Israeli policies. Even us Palestinian Christians have been attacked and called all sorts of things. We have been labeled dehumanized, demonized. Uh, all of these are actual things that were said on uh, some of the movements I lead, like Christ at the Checkpoint, because we dare to challenge the Christian Zionist uh, narrative. Uh, the whole idea is not to engage in a dialogue, not to treat us as equals, but to label us so that we are feared, we, we are perceived as a threat, so that people don't engage with us, uh, you know, it's as if I imagine this is the other side where, you know, you look at the wall from the Israeli side and this is what you see. Don't go to Bethlehem because you will hear, uh, uh, you will see all of these, uh, these, uh, these things. Yeah. You know, I stopped collecting things that were set or, you know, looking at articles that were, and, and it's fascinating to me. These are Christians attacking us because we spoke our just narrative and, we said, we, 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 we have a different way of living. The whole phenomena of silencing Palestinian Christians is not new. And uh, yes, we've seen Israel trying to silence us. Uh, we've seen examples of Israeli politicians interfering to uh, uh, stop airing segments in, in documentaries about Palestinian Christians in American TV, for example. Uh, uh, as I said, it's all uh, in, in my book. But even worse, I've seen Christians silencing us Palestinian Christians where we are invited to speak in conferences and then the invitation is withdrawn. Why? Because again, we are a Palestinian. This, this means that sometimes there has been conferences in Christian seminaries uh, where there was no Palestinian speaker because no one was deemed worthy to speak because the Christian Jewish lobby or Christian Zionist lobby challenged the idea of that Palestinian Christian speaker and that they cannot speak. No one of us could speak. Uh, I was once invited to a conference in Ireland. And uh, when there was a big fuss about my presence there, and they almost withdrew the invitation, but uh, in the end, they didn't. Other cases, the invitation was withdrawn in USA. But in this conference, what I'll never forget is what they said. Because I, I said, why are they challenging my presence? Is it anything I said? Do they know me? Did I anger them or so? They say, oh, no, they don't know you. It is because you're a Palestinian. And I want you to pause for that. It was actually a mission conference. And the other conference where my invitation was withdrawn was also a mission conference. Is there anything about the Christian faith, about God's heart to reach to people, to God who, who loves the world? But if I happen to have a different perspective about Israel and Palestine, maybe that means in their mind that God does not love me. I don't know. But that's, that's really the idea. Palestinian Christians are silenced because we challenge the stereotype, because we challenge the common narrative when we insist that this is not a clash between the Judeo-Christian tradition, civilization, and Islamic terrorism, but this is a political conflict. Yes, religious extremism is a challenge, but occupation is the core issue. And that is not a message that is well received by, uh, by many. And when we speak, please realize that we are not well received because to them, we are not uh, equal as if we, we don't present a proper theology. They always dismiss us as Palestinian, contextual, replacement, but we are not authentic understanding of, 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 of theology. It's a long quote by Palestinian theologian Paul Terezi, uh, but I love what he says is how, you know, how can they say so when they are repenting on our ground over a deed which happened on theirs? All this based on a premise we reject. This is a real combination of theological and political imperialism, trying to dictate the narrative and trying to say, we will interpret the Bible for you. You cannot tell us how, you know, as if present a, a, a Palestinian uh, perspective. 
This is why the Bible continues today to be weaponized, whether by Israeli politicians as here in the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations or by Christian leaders. And here I love this quote by the Kairos Palestine group, um, uh, a document that was written in 2019. And in it, we state unequivocally that any use of the Bible to legitimize or support political option and positions that are based upon injustice imposed by one person on another or by one people on another transform religion into human ideology and strip the word of God of its holiness, its universality and truth. Uh, whether for Kairos or for most Palestinian Christian speakers, justice matters. And we must emphasize that at the core, the problem with Christian Zionist theology and ideology is that it's devoid of justice. Even justice is relativized. I, I want to use a quote from another Christian Zionist leader who said that if, if Palestinians refuse to recognize what God says about the Jewish people and their connection to the land of Israel, then suffering will result. So you see, the problem is that we don't accept their theology. Justice in regards to the land requires that there be a submission to what God has declared about this land, basically that it belongs to Israel. So if the Palestinians do not acknowledge God's promise, they are foundationally unjust and are themselves resisted by God and lose their rights to the land. So you see justice here or injustice is not about confiscation of land or treating people as second class citizens or denying them from the natural resources in their own lands. But to him, injustice is when you don't accept what the Bible says about Israel, or let's put it more clearly, what he interprets about the Bible saying about the Jewish uh, people. Now, before I present a quick rebuffle or challenge to Christian Zionism uh, in the last five minutes, I want just to, to highlight this important concept that Christian Zionism, especially in some of its forms in North America, is not actually that friendly to the Jewish people. This was brilliantly highlighted by a recent documentary by Israeli journalist Maya Zinstein, and I believe it was shown on, on BBC, uh, called The Kingdom Come, or Till Kingdom Come, which shows that at its core, a lot of Christian Zionists believe in a vision in which two thirds of the Jews will be massacred and the other third will then convert to Christianity. Uh, they have so many, uh, uh, you know, th they're obsessed with end times and they see, as I say in my books, they relate to Jews mainly as objects in their eschatological fantasies rather than neighbors or people of faith deserving our attention and love as God commands us to love the neighbor. And so that documentary written from a Christian Israeli perspective challenges the notion that these are our friends and highlights how many times they uh, uh, act precisely against peace agreements and, uh, and so on. So I strongly recommend that, uh, that documentary. My point is uh, a critical analysis to Christian Zionism will show that it is not really that friendly uh, to Jews themselves, but it's all based on interest and self-interest. Uh, self I want to present a few principles that we as Palestinian Christians from our perspective challenge, uh, in which we challenge Christian Zionism. It's not enough to criticize, but it's important to provide an alternative. Uh, first, uh, you know, uh, it, it's important to challenge the silence of the church about injustice and its apathy manifested in pilgrimage, for example, in the, you cannot continue to speak about our land as if it's empty. It doesn't work anymore. What about the Palestinians? That's, an, that's the question we want to continue to challenge Christian Zionists with. But more importantly, what about God's call for us to be peacemakers? It's missing completely from the Christian Zionist narrative. What is the vision for peace? What is the vision for Palestinians? Uh, and even in the best forms of Christian Zionism, who say we want to recognize the Palestinian presence, they're not willing to say truth uh, to power. One of my observations have been is that uh, uh, there are many Christians who might not identify as Christian Zionists, yet maybe uh, present a challenge to peace by their silence, uh, by doing nothing or by simply being diplomatic. 
and the, you know, praying for both sides. Uh, we want to listen to both sides. And I say, you know, that's maybe equally harmful because we need Christians who speak truth. We need Christians who challenge power and who, who call for uh, justice. And my final important point is that Christian Zionism as its core is an exclusive dismissive ideology that, that excludes others. Our response to that should be, and that's a response of the Palestinian church, a vision in which the land is shared rather than divided by walls. A land in which uh, the dignity of all people, the equality of all people uh, born in the image of God is celebrated. This is God's land. And as such, we must learn how to live in God's land because it belongs to God. It doesn't belong to any ethnicity or religion. And we certainly don't solve it by trying to understand to whom did God make the promise 4,000 years ago and who are the descendants of that people. You know, we can do much better than that. When I say a shared land, I mean that all the dwellers of the land share it and its resources equally. They have the same rights, regardless of religion, ethnicity, or nationality. This is not what we have. What we have right now is a reality of occupation or even apartheid, uh, two laws, one that applies to a people and that. And so before we can talk about any peace, any vision for the future, I think we must challenge the occupation. That should be the priority of the church. And that's where we should challenge Christian Zionists as well, because they are at peace with the idea of the occupation. They don't recognize it even. And what they don't see is that occupation is harmful to both of us. This is a quote I love from the Karus document, again, which says, our future and their future are one. In other words, if you truly care for the Jews, then you must insist that they treat Palestinians with dignity and justice prevails and the just peace happens. The alternative is a cycle of violence that destroys both of us uh, and that uh, will not benefit uh, you know, any uh, of us. In other words, uh, you know, Christian Zionists do not have that vision for peace. It all, as I said, begins by ending the occupation. Again, let me read from Kairos. Even though we have fought one another in the recent past and still struggle today, we are able to love and live together. We can organize our political life with all its complexity according to the logic of this love and its power after ending the occupation and establishing justice. What I love about these quotes and what I want to highlight here is that our response to an exclusive ideology that functions on the basis of superiority cannot be another exclusive one or another religious vision in which there is one nation or one people or even one religion that we assume is their, the followers of that religion are simply superior to others, but rather it must be an inclusive nature, an inclusive uh, ideology uh, that welcomes and incorporates all. I want to refer you in the end to a document called Cry for Hope, which challenges churches to revisit their positions, their theology, offers ways to uh, empower uh, Palestinian uh, uh, perspectives and resistance, not just talk, but offers practicals, practical uh, uh, ways uh, and, and gives, as I said, uh, guidelines for how Christians can act to end the occupation uh, uh, nonviolently and in, in a ways that, that honor uh, God. Thank you for, uh, again, your kind attention and uh, I'm more than happy to receive uh, some questions uh, at, at this stage. Thank you so much for giving us that presentation. Um, as you can imagine, we've had lots of questions where I can tell you now, we're not going to be able to get through all of them. We've had so many, um, but I'm going to try to get through as many as possible. Um, some of the questions have been answered further along in your talk, so I will be skipping those. So um, apologies to those people. I'm going to start with Angus Rhodes, um, who asked a question. First, I'm going to tell you about Angus Rhodes. I know him as a fundraiser. He fundraises for um, St. John Eye Hospital, which I know you're familiar with as well. And um, I'm highlighting him because he is completing currently the Herculean tasks um, in order to fundraise for, for St. John's. 
So his version of the Herculean task. So he's been jumping out of planes, doing multiple marathons in, you know, within a short period of time, fire walking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he is, he says he's typing as a Christian. And he says, Christ was born as a Jew and instructs that his kingdom was not of this world. To Christians, the promised land was in fact the kingdom of heaven, which a Christian could only hope to reach after death. How could they possibly interpret that they're even uh, there even being a physical promised land when they have been taught inherently that this is not meant to be a physical one. Likewise, how can Christians find any kind of justification for violence or persecution when it is expressly forbidden in their own teachings? Yeah, no. Um, Big question. Also, <laughs> uh, uh, loaded questions that demand a lot of uh, 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 explanation or so. First of all, uh, I, I, let, let me say something about uh, my Christian hope. I mean, I'm certainly uh, looking, you know, uh, believe in life after death and in, in end times and, and not end times, sorry, in life after death or um, in a new heavens and a new earth. But to me, the kingdom of God is, is, an, is an earthly phenomenon that we experience now when we fulfill the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. It's not about escaping this, this world. Uh, what happened is that some Christians kind of uh, adopted this mentality that the world is evil and we don't belong to this world. And as such created a dichotomy between an Old Testament vision of the kingdom versus a New Testament vision of the kingdom where they believe that the Old Testament vision is earthly, is uh, a political kingdom, and that is for Israel. But we have a spiritual kingdom uh, escaping this world, if you wish, or living in a spiritual reality for, uh, for Christians. Creating that dichotomy uh, uh, then led to creating a system in which uh, they promoted the idea that one day the church will disappear and will go back to the Old Testament days. And so they see all of this just as a first step of the eschatological um, uh, uh, unfolding uh, of eschatological events in which there will be a messianic kingdom on earth. So they're expecting Jesus to come and actually rule uh, uh, in a Davidic fashion as a political ruler from Jerusalem. But the church must disappear to give way uh, to that. So that's how not all, but some or a good percentage of Christian Zionists uh, believe, and that allows them to create this dichotomy. So they would agree with, with the uh, premise that, yes, our kingdom as Christians is spiritual and so on, but that's not for Israel. Israel has a different uh, uh, destiny. Right. There is a lot there, isn't there? Um... I've got uh, two questions that I'm lumping together because they are very similar. Um, one is from our trustee, Roger Spooner, um, and co-founder with his wife, Monica Spooner of the Balfour Project. Um, how many Zion, Christian Zionists do you know who have changed their views and how do we help change more of them? And from Patrick Darnes, have you any advice to Christians that are, are not Christian Zionists to challenge their beliefs? Yes. So how many Christian Zionists changed their views? Not enough, obviously. <laughs> We've seen some. Uh, I know some, uh, but certainly not enough. Um, you must understand that to change a Christian Zionist is not simply to present a alternative perspective, but is to deconstruct years and years of teaching in Sunday school, in youth group, and from the pulpit. Uh, so this is not something that you know, is done easily. Um, usually, Christian Zionists to change. The first thing is they go through a crisis in which they ask themselves, why were we taught all of this when the reality on the ground differs? And so that brings me to bring the two questions together. Uh, I have come to see that the most effective way of challenging Christian Zionists is by presenting them with the reality on the ground. That's why we wish people come to Bethlehem and see, or to Ramallah or to Hebron. We wish people come and see the impact of the occupation on our lives. 
and then we wish they meet Palestinians uh, to challenge their, uh, you know, I cannot tell you how many uh, uh, Western Christians I've met who uh, hesitated even to meet us, were afraid, and they admitted that, and then they discovered, oh, they're nice. I mean, come on. So you have to deconstruct and to struggle with years of molding and uh, uh, of viewing the world. And let's, let's be honest, viewing the world from a position of privilege and then as such assuming that you get it. And then only to be uh, shocked by an alternative reality. And it takes time, it takes time. So reality on the ground and always challenge Christian Zionists, what about Palestinians and especially Palestinian Christians? They have a different perspective. Have you read a book? Have you listened to a talk? Have you met a Palestinian Christian? To me, that's the most effective way of beginning a conversation with a Christian Zionist. Uh, thanks for that. I confirm that, yes, we Palestinians are very nice. Um, I've got a question from Magan, another one of our trustees. Um, you had a, a conversation with an American evangelical pastor in the BBC documentary, Till Kingdom Come, uh, confirming it was on the BBC. Why was it so difficult to have any common understanding when the Bible is so clear about how to treat your brothers and sisters? Um, well, that, that, that pastor, um, you know, used the Bible to uh, support his ideology. So when he said, I don't believe there's anything Palestinian, you know, who would just go to the Bible and look at the Israel kingdom and interpret it as, so uh, it's not simply, you know, it's about interpretation. It, what's interesting in, in that conversation is that uh, uh, that pastor uh, actually, when I ask him, does the principles were or the, the guidelines that God gave Joshua when he entered Jericho to go and kill everyone still apply today? And he thought about it and he said, yes. Uh, and I said, do you, I asked him twice to make sure it's not in the film, unfortunately. And I said, do you know, you just promoted ethnic cleansing to, to my people. Uh, and he was shocked and he tried, okay. Uh, and, and we talked for more than two hours, by the way. Uh, and I expected that he at least recognize our presence. But that illustrates how difficult it is to, you know, uh, uh, to challenge that. And I think the most important thing about that encounter is that Pastor Boyd thinks that, uh, I believe, and, you know, maybe, you know, I wish he is here with me to challenge him on that, simply because he comes from Kentucky and studied in, in seminary and knows the Bible, that he not just understand the Bible better than me, even though, of course, the Bible was written here, you know, Jesus, you know, was born in Bethlehem, but somehow they think they have it, get it right. Not only he's entitled to interpret the Bible for me, but he's, he, he understands my reality better than me. And that's a level, and, and let me be honest, that's a level of arrogance that's shocking to me. He want, comes from Kentucky just two hours with me, and then he thinks he's able and entitled and understands my reality better than me. Uh, so when I say as a form of imperial theology, that's the essence of it. We know better. And that brings me quite nicely onto the next bunch of questions. I'm trying to plow through them because we have so many. Um, but we've had a, a couple of people ask, um, for example, John Pritchard, Shazia Gleedal, again, apologies if I'm mispronouncing names, um, but they've commented that the Christian Zionism seems to be more of an American phenomenon and that they thankfully haven't come across it that much in Britain and in Europe. Do you have any comments on that? Well, uh, the origins of it were in Europe. So. Uh... Uh, there are many books about it, and Christian Zionism was influential um, uh, during the British mandate and influenced even uh, policies like the Belfort Declaration, and that's also documented in studies to mention Stephen Sizer as one as just one, and Robert Smithall's book on the uh, origins of Christian Zionism shows clearly that it began with the Puritans and, and later expanded. John Nelson Darby, who started dispensationalism, which became to be very influential in North America, was, was Irish. Uh, now, what about today? 
um, for sure it's strongest in, in America. And it's part of the dichotomy that exists today between conservatives and liberals today, uh, where everything is either this or that. And part of the conservative fundamentalist uh, fold right there has become support uh, for Israel. But I've traveled and seen multiple forms of support to Israel in Europe. Uh, um, you know, the Protestant churches in Europe are very much pro-Israel, um, with some ex ex exceptions here and there, and with some exceptions, especially with uh, among certain congregations. What I want also, I think it's important to say, is that the support among Protestant Christians in Europe and among Catholic Christians in Europe to Israel is based on somehow a different premise. And that's the idea that God is still faithful and in connection or a relationship with the Jewish people uh, uh, without necessarily referring to end time scenarios and eschatology. So they believe in what one might call uh, as if God has two different communities or people, one special relationship with the Jews that has not ended. And part of it is uh, trying to correct the wrongs of anti-Semitism in Europe. So uh, the church adopted position that's very helped, very friendly and looks at Jews as God's people. And so when I, for example, when I read the statement, the creation of the state of Israel is a sign of God's faithfulness to the Jewish people, that is an official statement from the Dutch Protestant church. Uh, so uh, that view is prevalent these views, they do, if you talk to these people in, in the Netherlands, they would say, we don't care about these end time scenarios that Americans talk about and prophecies and so on, but we just want to highlight the connection between uh, Israel and God on one hand and uh, Jews and the land uh, on, the, uh, on the other. So no, it is, it is in Europe, but not necessarily as strong as it is among evangelicals in America. Um, thank you for that. We've got um, a couple of comments on your response there. Peter Buckley says that it's alive and well in Britain, but not so visible because it has little political clout in the UK compared to the USA. And uh, Rose S says that sadly, it's very strong in South African churches across the denominations and race groups. Um, Okay, so uh, we've got, well, a quick question for you. Hopefully the answer is yes. The question is Abigail Abisal Metzger asks if your thesis is published and available. Uh, yes, um, the short answer is yes. Uh, it's called From Land to Lands from Eden to the Renewed Earth, uh, but it's very much into biblical studies. So it's a, uh, thorough investigation, uh, one of the most comprehensive works on the theme of promised land in the Bible. It doesn't touch on the political reality on the daily or the contemporary issues, but it's just going through the biblical uh, text. Uh, my challenge to Christian Zionism is in the other book, The Other Side uh, of the War. Thank you so much. And um, like with your other publications, I, have, um, I will ask you for links or the best place to find them and to purchase them so that we can share that with everyone. Um, we've got a question from Vicky Karali. Does the divine right of return of Jews to Palestine prohibit any coexistence with other people? She says Palestinians, Christians, Muslim, Bedouin, maybe it's not necessarily a faulty theology, but it's implementation that is wrong. Uh, I think that's a question that must be asked to the Zionists and their supporters, not to us. In other words, um, I've heard many Zionist intellectuals say that, look, for example, at someone like Martin Buber, who believed that uh, Zionism could coexist with Arabs, and we want to live side by side with the Arabs, maybe even in one state or so on. Uh, to me, all of this talk is nice but irrelevant because so far the uh, only and dominant expression of Zionism that I deal with is the, uh, the current one, which is the, the Netanyahu's uh, rhetoric and, uh, you know, just the elections yesterday, um, Israel keeps shifting to the right and keeps, you know, having no room for us as, uh, as Palestinians. 
So uh, listen, if, if Jewish rabbis, theologians, intellectuals uh, believe that they have um, a divine right to the land, or if Jewish historians, you know, use the uh, historical data, and certainly there is, you know, uh, relevance there. Uh, that's that's a Jewish question, and every every people have the right to. But to me, I I look at Zionism the way it's relating to me, and certainly it's dismissive. Certainly it's exclusivist. So. Uh, the, the, that's when, when people ask that question, I think you should address that to, to the Zionists and challenge the Zionist movement, not ask it uh, uh, to me. So far, the answer to that question from my perspective is no. Uh, I wish I am wrong. If I am wrong, just then Israel has to show that to me and it's not mine. Thank you for that answer. Um, the next question is from Omar Dorsey. Is teaching the Old Testament extensively part of Zionism, Zionist control on our churches? Uh, it, 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 it could be, um, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, the reason I say that is I, I am a Christian leader. And, and by the way, uh, as a theologian, if you want to insist on putting me in a camp, I'll probably fall under a, a somehow a conservative camp, especially in how I understand scripture. I teach the Old Testament. I preach from it. I find in it excellent material about justice. I find in it excellent material about inclusivity, uh, about God's desire to bless all the nations through Abraham. Uh, some of the more powerful uh, statements on justice and challenging uh, privilege and racism and uh, inclusive, some of the most, you know, things about inclus including others in the, are found in the Old Testament. So it, I, I guess it all depends on how one reads it uh, and uh, where do we put our emphasis. And of course, as a Christian leader, I must read uh, the Hebrew scripture or Old Testament the way uh, uh, Jesus read it, the way Paul read it. And, uh, you know, uh, Jesus himself challenge certain issues in the Old Testament. Jesus himself, uh, we one could say, broke certain rules when, for example, uh, the emphasis was not much on what you eat, but what comes out of your heart. So, you know, we cannot just take the Old Testament without doing some reinterpretation on it based on the coming uh, of Christ. At least that's my, uh, my perspective. So I don't want to put the problem in the Old Testament itself, but in how uh, people uh, use it. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Robin Keeley, who I'm sure you're familiar with, former Consul General to Jerusalem. Um, how does the Christian mission to the Jews fit into the overall picture with Christ Church by the Jaffa Gate and uh, running the International School in Jerusalem? Do they have a political agenda beyond encouraging closer links between Judaism and Christianity? Um. Yeah, uh, honestly, I don't know much about Christ Church to, to answer with certainty. So I don't want to give a, a judgment. They certainly come across as uh, very pro-Israel. And, uh, and the, the whole, you know, um, theologically, one might put them in the uh, restorationist camp. In other words, they do have the belief that uh, Jews will come to faith in Christ at some point before the second coming uh, of Christ. Uh, to me, um, when one just look at it from that thing, you know, I, again, uh, in my book, I argue that whenever we relate to Jews based on their place in our eschatology, I think that's what the problem is. Uh, because, you know, we Christians seem to want to, th to think that we know what will happen in the future and then try to fit in God's purposes for the future. Um, and I don't think that's a helpful approach at all. Uh, what I suggest instead is the whole concept of loving, love your neighbor as yourself, regardless of whether your neighbor is a Jew or a Muslim. 
uh, if my main, you know, uh, uh, shape of Judaism and the Jewish people and then political issue is shaped by, by what I believe will happen in the future or what is happening right now, uh, uh, you know, God is fulfilling prophecy and so on, it will certainly blind me from uh, 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 relating to injustices or to, uh, 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 you know, one of the things we say, for example, is we insist on relating to Israel as a secular state based on the international law. That's all we're asking as Palestinians. But when you see Israel as part of God's unfolding drama, that will influence how you uh, uh, relate to Israel. And I think that's where I would challenge movements like Christ Church and the whole uh, movement related uh, uh, or that whole uh, movement. Well, um, that's a phrase, God's unfolding drama. <laughs> um, I We're wrapping up now because um, we've made you speak for over an hour now. Um, but I want to end on this question from Debbie Hubbard because I hope it'll end this conversation on a hopeful note. Um, she says, in my church, we do not hear anything about Palestine preached from the pulpit or engaged in learning about the reality on the ground. Any thoughts on how we might begin the conversation in our church? Yes, um, thank you, Debbie. It's a good way to end this. Um, I, you know, I appreciate what many of our friends are doing in England and there was a movement to bring Palestinian sermons to uh, uh, churches in England to be read in churches. I think it was the Friends of Sabil UK that, that led that uh, initiative. But uh, as I said, uh, there are multiple ways, uh, whether it's, we're there, we have books, we have articles, uh, we have uh, many, many uh, media resources, videos that present our perspective. And today's world, uh, the post-COVID-19 world, gives us the opportunity to uh, zoom in, you know, Christian leaders to speak to uh, 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 to churches uh, and congregations. Uh, there must be, be first the desire to say, we have ignored uh, uh, the Palestinian reality, the Palestinian church's reality, and it's time that we listen. Uh, and uh, when I say listen, you know, there must be the willingness and the humility to listen and accept, you know, that maybe we have, uh, as I said, ignored uh, 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 the perspective of our sisters and brothers. And so there are many things, uh, books, videos, articles, social media, uh, and we're willing to come in person uh, post-COVID or uh, be brought through Zoom or so on. Uh, and, 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 and there are many organizations in the UK that facilitate that, uh, whether Kair Sabil uh, is, is just one uh, uh, example uh, as well. Thank you so much uh, for speaking to us today, for giving your time. And um, I want to thank you on behalf of the Balfour Project and all the attendees. Attendees, thank you as always for joining us on our monthly webinar. I've um, posted a couple of our upcoming events in the chat box, um, but you can find them on our website. We've got a whole selection of events coming up, um, which are very exciting. And we have a conference in May on the rule of law. So that one will be fascinating, I think. So thank you again, Monter. Um, Thank you everyone for joining us and we will see you at our next event. Bye. Thank you.